الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وأسوتنا وقائدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وبعد Respected brothers and sisters, first of all, alhamdulillah, all praise is for our Lord and our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an honor to be here today with you uh, at Liverpool University. I just realized that there are two major, both are major, right? Two major universities in Liverpool. For me, Liverpool, I've, I've hardly been here. It's, it's really far. I'm from Leicester. Yeah, you guys are talking about Liverpool, Manchester. There's a place called Leicester as well, if, by the way. Um, for me, Liverpool, uh, I haven't been here much. I think once before. Uh, this is the first time I'm actually speaking here anywhere in Liverpool. I've known Liverpool for, like one of the brothers said, for the famous football club, well, two famous football teams. They say there's two major football teams in Liverpool. One is Liverpool and the other is Liverpool Reserves. So um, it's, it's good to be here. And it's quite ironic that I've come to Liverpool on a day where the football club is at the High Court in London f for a battle on ownership affairs or whatever. But anyway, inshallah. Um, I want to, time is very short. With you, I want to, what I want to do is just share one, two, three, four, six, seven points that I thought might be beneficial for all of us here today, for students who are beginners, who have just come, and the older students as well. Six, seven points, these are just random points. So I don't have a specific topic or a theme that I'm going to follow. These are seven random points and topics that I think are very important, inshallah. And Allah grant me the tawfiq, the ability, uh, the divine tawfiq to say that which is beneficial for myself and all of you, inshallah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, all of us and all of you, you've come here for a purpose. You've come here to study. You've come here to seek some knowledge. You've come here to seek education and knowledge. And we as Muslims, right, and even non-Muslims, but Muslims in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran and Sunnah places a great deal of emphasis on education and knowledge. Religious knowledge, sacred knowledge, as well as secular knowledge. When Allah says in the Quran, قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Can those who have knowledge be equal to those who do not have knowledge? The scholars explain, the commentators of the Quran, that this is not restricted to sacred knowledge. This also includes in it secular knowledge. So Islam greatly emphasizes, greatly emphasizes and encourages Muslims to educate themselves, to seek knowledge, to do something worthwhile in their lives and serve humanity and serve human beings. Medicine is one of the greatest of no, uh, sciences that Muslims have considered to be one of the greatest of sciences. One of the great Imams, and I just discovered as well that many of you are medics or studying medicine. Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu, one of the great Imams of this Ummah, he said, Al-ilmu ilman, ilmu al-fiqhi lil-adiyan wa ilmu al-tibbi lil-abdan. Sciences worth studying are really only two. He said, ilmu al-fiqhi lil-adiyan, the science of religion, the science of fiqh which deals with your next life and and the science of medicine which is which caters for your body so islam places a great deal of emphasis on medicine on on wherever you're studying inshallah but the first point that i want to share with you here is that in order for our studying in order for our coming to the university on a, on a regular basis in order for us to gain the reward from our lord and our creator allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order 
order for us to be doing something that's rewarding in the sight of Allah, we have to do something which is very important, which is tasheehu niyyah. That's the first point. And I really urge you, if you can make notes of make notes of these few points, inshallah, as a reminder for the future. Imam Shafi'i also said, Al-ilmu saydun, wal kitabatu qaydun. Knowledge is something that you hunt for and then to, to, to capture that knowledge, you have to write it down. So, first point is tasheehu niyyah, correcting, correction of one's intention. Correcting one's intention is actually very important in Islam. One of the greatest thing a Muslim has, a weapon. If you look at the hadith books, if you look at all the collections of hadith, starting from Sahih al-Bukhari, and most of them, the majority of them, they start with a famous hadith, the saying, the tradition of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings be upon him. He says, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Verily, indeed, actions are by the intention. If somebody has a righteous intention behind a worldly act, then he gains or she gains the reward of that. We, which means that, you see, whatever we do in this life, even regular mundane activities, for a Muslim eating, drinking, sleeping, conversing, interacting, studying, coming to the university also becomes an act of ibadah, becomes an act of worship. You're actually getting a reward for coming and studying here. But the condition is your intention has to be correct. You have to change your perspective. You have to change your intention. You're going to come here and study anyway. For a Muslim getting a career, pursuing a career, and having a career, and getting a job, and earning money, and, and having some wealth, is a secondary objective. It's, ne it's nevertheless, it is a objective. I'm not saying completely overlook that, but it's a secondary secondary objective. The first and foremost objective for a Muslim is to please his or her Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what intention should you have? Like the brother mentioned the hadith, and I, th I read, I think he mentioned it or I read it in, in, in that program note that you have, uh, student's guide. Man nafasa, there's a hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Sahih of Imam Muslim. Man nafasa an Muslim in kurbatan min kurabid dunya. Karab, nafasa Allahu anhu kurbatan fi Whoever alleviates, whoever removes a difficulty, a hardship from a Muslim, and this does not mean only Muslims, it's not restricted to only Muslims. In this particular hadith, Muslim has been mentioned, but if you look at Islamic literature, all the scholars say generally all the hadiths, unless otherwise proven, when the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, when he says, whoever does not harm a Muslim, 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 it's, it's because at that time he was only discussing and talking and focusing on the Muslims and they had the Muslim community and Muslims amongst themselves, right? So this is not restricted to the Muslims only. Whoever alleviates anything from anyone, any hardship, any difficulty, Wallahu fi awnil abd. This is another hadith. Wallahu fi awni al abd. Ma kana al abdu fi awni akhi. Allah remains in the assistance of his slave as long as the slave is in the assistance of his fellow brother or sister. So this is the intention. You will come here and study anyway. Change your perspective. You're studying medicine. Why am I studying medicine? Or whatever you're studying. I want to serve humanity. I want to do something positive in the community. I want to help the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Khidmatul khalq. And this only happens, brothers and sisters, this only comes about if we have mercy in our hearts. Love and mercy only happens and we have to have mercy the hadith in the sunnah of imam abu dawood ar-rahimun yarhamuhum ar-rahman irhamu man fil ard yarhamkum man fi sama have mercy on this hadith is quite ironic because it doesn't say have mercy on the muslims irhamu man fil ard have mercy on the people on the earth the one in the heavens, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not literally speaking, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy on you. So this is, we need to create that love, that affection. And with that, it will result in us wanting to serve humanity, wanting to do something for the creation of Allah. Be positive, do something positive in the society, in the community. So you have to change your intention. That's the first point. And those of you who have not 
inshallah I hope everybody has that kind of intention but if you don't then right now at this moment in time look down in your hearts and say okay from this minute what time is it 831 in my, my, my clock you watch here right now Make an intention that, okay, oh Allah, remember, intention is so easy. It doesn't require any wealth or any money. You don't have to spend anything. It's a niyatu amalul qalb. You don't even have to say it verbally. It's in the heart. It's in the heart. You don't have to even speak it and say it verbally. Just think to yourself that my perspective is I want to please Allah. I want to become a medic, a doctor, for example. Why? Because inshallah, I want to help and assist. If I, as long as I am in the assistance and help of others, Allah will help me. And this is a Muslim. A Muslim's duty does not end with his duty towards his Lord. It goes far beyond that. A Muslim's duty and responsibility is that he fulfills the rights of his Lord and also the, he fulfills or she fulfills the rights of his fellow human beings. So change your perspective, change your intention and whatever you'll do, even coming every day traveling and commuting weekly, daily to the university will become an act of ibadah. Just imagine, just imagine you take, you catch the train and you're traveling and that's an act of ibadah. Subhanallah, what a beautiful religion. You take a taxi, you've, taken, you've paid some money, you've taken a taxi, you've come here. That spending of money will be an act of ibadah, it's charity. Just because of that perspective that you've changed, the intention that you've corrected. Tasheehu niyyah. Imam Abdullah ibn Mubarak, one of the great imams of this ummah, he said, Rubba amalin saghirin tukabbiruhu niyyah wa rubba amalin kabirin tusaghiruhu niyyah. Sometimes an action outwardly, it sounds, it seems very minute, very small. Rubba amalin saghir. But the intention behind it makes it huge in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa rubba amalin kabirin. And the opposite is also true. Sometimes we outwardly, externally, an act may be a great act of ibadah. You're probably spending 60,000 pounds and giving a donation of 50,000 pounds to a charity. But the intention behind it, it's small, so Allah will make that act extremely small in, on the Day of Judgment. The, the niyyah, the intention has a great role to play. So that's the second, first point, inshallah. Point number two, these are, remember, seven, seven, as I said, seven random points. Point number two. What's the first point? Go on, speak. What's the first point? You already forgot the first point? What's the first point? I'll ask you at the end, inshallah. That's easy to remember. Correction of intention. Point number two. Don't come here and waste your time. And I'm sure you won't be wasting your time. You need to work hard. Islamically, again, a Muslim, whatever she or he does, right? A Muslim, a believer, has to put in the effort, work hard, try their best, and become an expert in the field that they are in. You have to be an expert. You need to try to work hard. You need to try to aim for the best. You know, number two is, is not good enough. And this is very important. Like, there's a hadith, in, this is a sound hadith in the Sunnah of Imam Abu Dawood. And this is specifically relating to medics, but you can generalize it. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he actually said, Ayyuma rajulin tababbaba. Any person, any individual who like studied and he became a medic and he got a bit of uh, education in terms of medicine. Tatabbaba. He's not really a tabib. He's not really qualified. He's not really someone who's an expert in his field. But yeah, he studied medicine. He didn't really work hard. He's not qualified enough. He's not a good enough doctor because he's, every time you go to him, he's giving you a paracetamol. You know, every time some doctors, the only thing you've got to... Paracetamol. Paracetamol. Okay, I mean, we used to have a doctor like that, like, then he got fired, by the way. But anyway, he is a qualified doctor. And so this, this hadith is saying, someone, a rajulun tababbaba, he is not really qualified, he didn't work hard. And then, fa'anata fahuwa bamin. This is a sound hadith. And he starts practicing medicine, and he starts prescribing medicine, and then if he makes a mistake, fa'anata, 
Fahuallamin, he will be held responsible, not just in the next life, even in this life. In in a no, in a Muslim country, in when you have Islamic uh, laws, there's actually laws that govern the practice, the malpractice of a of a doctor. That you have to, there's compensation, there's penalty, there's expiation. So you have to work hard. You become experts in whatever field you are in. You need to help and serve the Muslim community. You need to serve the general wider community. So be experts, work hard, put in the effort, inshallah ta'ala. Number three, point number three, and this is relating to point number two, is to value your time. Time is precious, especially at this age. SubhanAllah, it's just, it's unique. It's the most important time for a human being. When they are in their late teens, early 20s, mid 20s, from about 18 till 30, it's the prime time of your life. It's a make or break of your life. You know, value time. The, the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, the messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings be upon him. What did he say? He said, Ni'matani maghboonun fihima kathirun minan nas. There are two bounties, two gifts that Allah bestows upon every human, but maghboonun fihima kathirun minan nas. Most of the, most people, the majority of the people, they are deluded. They are deceived, they are deluded. They, they, they neglect these two, well, they overlook them. They take them for granted. Number one, as-sihha, health. Health is a great ni'mah. Right now, alhamdulillah, we are all healthy, we are walking. We don't realize the importance of health unless Allah forbid something goes wrong. Right? And number two, al-faraq, time. When you, do, when you have time, we don't appreciate the great ni'mah. Time is so precious for a Muslim. Allah takes oath by the time in the Quran. Wal Asr, whole surah, you know, in the last juz of the Quran, the last chapter. Wal Asri, inna insana da fi khusr. By time, verily humanity is in loss. Time, when Allah takes a oath by something, this means that that particular thing or item is great in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So value time. Time is like gold. Al waqtu kadhahab. Like the, some of them said, time is like gold, but the one who actually appreciates it. Don't waste time. Don't spend you know, your evenings just going to a shisha cafe and having shishas for three hours. Come on, you know, your students don't do that. It's another debate whether it's halal or haram. I don't want to talk about that, but students don't do that. You know, you have, a, you, have a, uh, you have an objective in life, you have a purpose in life. You're not one of those, we are not one of those who waste our precious time in futile activities. Every minute, it's like spend a minute. You know, some of the scholars, like one of my teachers used to say, Shaykh Taqi Uthman used to say, that you know when you time, spend it like at least one pound. One minute is like a pound. So if you want to give somebody one minute, you know, think, one pound, how, how careful are we? One pound, we won't just throw one pound away just like that. We'll think, is it really worthwhile giving this pound for this thing in return? Likewise, is it worthwhile doing this particular form of action or activity in this particular minute? Every minute, every minute should be valuable. So appreciate time, value it, and utilize it in the best of ways. Number four, and this is very important, I'm going to be frank on this point, but you know, it has to be said. Point number four, we are studying in a university, alhamdulillah, there's no, it's great. But the challenges in studying in a place like this are great for sisters and for brothers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord and our Creator, has created us with natural wants, natural desires. Natural desires. You know, we, we have all, all human beings have been created with natural characteristics, attributes and desires, and these natural uh, desires within ourselves. We have anger. Allah created anger, right? Anger, anger the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a companion came to him, he said, O Messenger of Allah, Ya Rasulullah, O sini wa ojiz, give me advice, give me nasiha, make it short. He said, La taghadab, don't get angry. Second time he came and he asked him the question, he said, La taghadab. Third time he said, don't get angry. Now anger, as you know, it's evil and we should not be angry, we should try to control our anger. But yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still created anger within us. Why? 
There is a wisdom, there is a hikmah, there is a reason for everything because there are certain times where you need to be angry. You have to be angry certain times. You can't be a, a pacifist all the time. So there's a reason. There's, there's, a, there's a wisdom, there's a hikmah behind Allah creating these natural forces within ourselves. Likewise, there is a very natural force, a natural desire within the heart which is called lust. It's natural. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing to be ashamed of. You know, someone has this sexual desire or lust within herself or himself. You don't have to sh be shy. It's natural. It's just like anger, right? It's, it's nothing absolutely sinful. And this is the Islamic approach. You see, Islam is a modern religion. It teaches everything in moderation. We have two extremes. We have extreme to the right and we have extreme to the left. In certain faith communities and classically and historically, they had this approach that lust is evil, dirty, sinful, full stop. One of the deadliest sins. There is no right way of fulfilling that lustful nature a human being has. You can't get married, or you have this rahbaniyyah. It's in the Quran, Allah says, وَرَحْبَانِيَّ تَدِبُ تَدَعُوهَا This is uh, celibacy, or monasticism, that they... They invented it, they invented it and introduced it upon themselves. We did not prescribe it on them. The hadith says, La sarurata fil Islam in the Sunan of Imam Abu Dawud. There is no celibacy in Islam. So Islam takes the middle approach. In certain faith communities, the extreme to the right is that's it. In order to procre uh, in order to attain proximity to God and to Allah, to become a righteous, devout, saintly human being, to be a good person, you have to sacrifice everything. Everything, which means control, that's it. There is no way of fulfillment of one's sexual desires. There is no way, even eating should not be, like you're gonna enjoy food right now. So in some communities they had this understanding uh, that you can't even enjoy food, eat only just for the basic need. Enjoyment is actually against the struggle, the mujahada, the, the struggle that a human being does in order to gain proximity to his God. Whereas we have another extreme on the other hand, which is in the present day jahiliyyah that we see, in terms of fulfilling one's desire in any way, shape or form, right? There are no restrictions, no conditions, just in any way, shape or form. You can fulfill, this is a natural desire in any way, shape or form. When I, mean, when I say in any way, shape or form, which means with whenever, with whoever and with whatever. Nowadays, it's whatever as well. It doesn't even have to be a human being. But anyway, that's another story. Um, so in Islam, Islam takes a middle approach. Islam says, look, it's natural. Brother, it's natural. You say you come to university. Islam places rules. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Mu'minun, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ مُعْرِضُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِلزَّكَاةِ فَاعِلُونَ And then Allah says, He's saying these are the individuals who are successful in this life and the next life. Even in this life. Seriously, even in this life. It's, it's mutlaq, it's am, aflah al mu'minun. They are successful because if someone controls and does what Allah, what Allah is saying right now, he has a steady life in this world as well. And the next life, of course. hum li furujihim hafidun. Those who protect, preserve, guard their modesty, their private parts and generally their body from fulfilling their lustful desires in an unlawful manner. And then Allah says, Illa ala azwajihim. Only through marriage. This is the middle approach that Islam takes. Islam places laws that outside of marriage, anything lustful fulfillment and the gratification of one's sexual desires and lustful desires is prohibited and lawful, sinful. I know you say, Sheikh, you come here, you know, this is a university, come on, there's so much fitna here, it's difficult. How can you control? This is what Islam says, control it. Allah says that, look, anger is natural. Control it, channel it, use it in the right place. Sexual lust and desire, passion, it's natural, it's normal. Control it, channel it, utilize it in the halal way. The halal way is through marriage and nothing else. Islam places Restrictions. Allah says, Wala taqrabu zina. Don't even come close to fornication. Let alone fornication itself. La taqrabu zina. Don't even come close to it. Innahu kana fahisha. Because it's evil. 
and wasa'a sabila it opens the doors to other sins this is the only middle way so I, as i was saying you say uh, you might say that it's there's so much fitna but seriously brother and sister listen to this carefully lust is a dangerous it's a dangerous uh, spiritual disease you know once a human being man or a woman as i said lust is natural normal but once they become the slaves of their lust they don't control it they don't channel it they don't protect their modesty and guard their modesty then what happens it's a never ending it's a never ending disease you can never be satisfied and this has been proven as, uh, medically as well and it's proven through, through research islamically of course it's a never ending one thing leads to another anyone who has this habit of fulfilling and gratifying their sexual needs and urges in any way without any uh, islamic legal moral restrictions when they start becoming slaves to their lustful nature there are two important natures in the human being that contribute to a, a man committing crimes and sinning and uh, violating the the obligations of his lord one is al-quwwatu shahwaniyah the other is al-quwwatu al-ghadabiyah the angry soul and the lustful soul i, I just a couple of weeks ago had a whole course on the lustful soul it's very important to learn about these things now once we become slaves then there's never ending you might think okay you know right now i'm young let me just mess around and when i get married when i'm 28 29 when i'll get you know when i'll graduate and then i'll buy a property i'll get three keys job car house you know and then when my family is ready family will never be ready i mean that's another problem with the families islam says marriage ya ma'shara shabab the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said oh young people get married because aghaddu lil basar it protects preserves your eyesight from uh, from placing lustful gazes and guards your modesty but we live unfortunately and this is for the parents we live unfortunately in a time where marriages are so difficult the more we make marriage difficult to, and it's not anything islamic islam says marriage is so simple one of the most simplest of activities you can do in islam is marriage it literally takes 7 seconds you know i counted the seconds once 7 seconds even the khutbah sermon is sunnah you say i give myself to you i accept you done Anyone ready? No. It's very simple. Seriously, it's it's so simple. It's the most and it's one of the most beautiful acts. It's an act of ibadah. Even the sexual relations between the spouses is an act of ibadah. Wa fi budi ahadikum sadaqa. But we make it difficult for ourselves. Our parents, our and these are all self-imposed cultural customs. Who says you can't marry while studying at university? Who says 18 is too too young to get married? Who says 21 is too young to get married? These are cultural practices and customs. Until this doesn't happen, that doesn't happen. Until my great granddad doesn't come from Bangladesh or Pakistan or somewhere, and they have to come, and he has to come, and she has to come, and until this is not done, these are restrictions. And that's why the more we close the doors for haram, the doors of halal, uh, the more we do, uh, close the doors for halal, the doors of haram open up. So what we have to remember, brothers, look, you might say at the university it's very difficult. There's a lot of fitna. But as I was saying, once we become slaves to our lust, it becomes a habit and there are people who had i know personally who came to me and mentioned that the situation that they had lustful uh, desires before they were married they had certain habits it becomes a disease it becomes an addiction and that's why recently in in the wake of all these you know famous uh, celebrities having affairs like you know uh, one was a footballer from here but now it's gone to manchester you know um and they married there are footballers and people who who are married who have wives who, but still they can't stop why is there anything wrong with their wife their wife is probably a model they might be the best looking woman in the world is there anything they need they've got money everything why I mean in in America there was an uh, there was a research done that the most rape was done in America in a country where sexual relations by consent it's 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 you know if somebody wants to have sexual relations with someone have a boyfriend girlfriend it's very easy 
but the rate of rape is far greater than those countries where it's difficult to have un uh, fornication and unlawful sexual relations. Why? Because once you become addicted to this whole lustful area of your life, then having sex through consent no longer is enjoyable. You become bored, now you want to try rape. That becomes boring, visit prostitution, prostitutes. That becomes boring. And that's why people get into these lustful diseases. And I'll tell you one thing, brothers and sisters. Once you get a habit, don't think, oh, I'm young, I'll sort myself out. Once you get married, because seriously, if you have habits before marriage, you will be 69 years old and that habit will still, still remain with you. I personally know a, an old man came to me. And sorry for being frank, I know it's brothers and sisters here. I won't mention the, the problem he had, but it's a, it's a disease. He said, I started this evil habit at the age of 16 and I'm 66 and I'm still trying to stop but I cannot stop and I'm married, I have children, I have grandchildren. So don't think before marriage, yes, you know, it's okay, you know, but once you get this habit of one girl and this next girlfriend, one boyfriend, next boyfriend, it just carries on. And sisters as well, don't take it for granted, you know, a oh, brother comes to you, he looks nice, smart, he's, he's like a bit like a sheikh or whatever, or he's very he's dressed well and everything, and he promises you marriage because you know what, 99% of the time he's not going to marry you. He's going to leave you in the loop, and you're going to be, your, your feelings will be hurt. It's just, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a bad situation. So don't think about marriage because relationships before marriage do not work. The hadith, Lam tara lil mithlu nikah. Allah places barakah and blessings in a union that is through marriage. Before marriage, it's not going to work. And remember another thing as well, that if you think that, okay, we want to marry, all the behavior before marriage is artificial. The brother is going to dress well, he'll see you, okay, I'll see you on Friday, okay. We'll go to the restaurant, I don't know if you have any good restaurants here, you may do. And then he'll take you there, and he'll t okay, you go into the taxi, and then it's raining, he'll take you, you're feeling cold, he'll quickly take his jacket off, and he's, oh, sister, you're feeling cold. And you go into the restaurant, and you know, he'll pull the chair out, sit down, sister, and this and that. After six years of marriage, is he going to do the same thing? I doubt it. Seriously, it's all artificial. It's that artificial behavior. And once you get accustomed to that, and then you get married, and if it's not like that anymore, then it's going to hit you hard. So don't go through, because it's, it's just artificial. Dating before marriage never works. You know, you say you want to get to know someone, you can never get to know someone, because you're not living with them. You, you, you're not paying the bills together. You're not changing the nappies of your babies. You're not going to Asda and Tesco and Sainsbury's with them. There, there are no responsibilities. It's just artificial, it's just one-off. You can never get to know anybody. Do it rightfully, properly, Islamically. Find out everything about the person, potential spouse, and do a halal nikah, and, and then inshallah Allah will bless you. And if you say it's very difficult, I'll tell you one thing. If, if you think it's very difficult, because there's so much fitna, Islam says even protect your eyes, lustful gazes, even not just in Islam, even in Christianity. Read the Bible, Jesus, peace be upon him. He said, Casting lustful gazes at the opposite gender is one of the greatest of evils and sins. Lustful gazes, I'm not talking about just normal gaze, lust with lust, with sexual desire. It's a sin in Christianity and maybe in Judaism as well and in Islam. Allah says in the Quran, Tell the believing men and women, lower your gazes. Do not cast lustful gazes at the opposite gender. For sisters, Allah said in the Quran, فَلَا تَخْدَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ Don't be soft in your conversation. You know when you talk with someone of the opposite gender, this is specifically directly directed to the sister. Allah says in the Quran, فَلَا تَخْدَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ Don't be seductive and uh, soft in the tone, in the manner that you speak with someone. Don't say, yes, brother, hello, hi, don't, don't do all that kind of stuff. Because the one who's got disease in his heart, he'll be inclined. When this verse of the Quran was revealed, some of the female companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they used to intentionally, deliberately roughen their voices. They used to speak in a rough tone. Yeah, brother, what's wrong? So that he doesn't get attracted. This is important. This is, these are all rules because remember, sight, a sight, the way you talk, flirtatious, 
flirtatious conversation. One thing leads to another. One thing leads to another. And before you know it, you'll end up somewhere which you're not supposed to be ending up. So anyway, these are some things. And even if there's fitna, you have to control it. This is a test. You know, there are sisters, there are brothers. We live in a community, but we have to. It's a test. Look at the story of Yusuf, Joseph, peace be upon him. Alayhi salatu afdalu taslim. In the Quran, Allah says he was seduced. She locked the doors. You know the story, there's no time. And he, what did he do? He controlled and he protected himself. He ran to the doors. The doors were bolted and locked. He still ran because what, what was in his capacity was to run to the doors. The doors, even though he knew, were locked. But it was then Allah who opened the doors for him, so we have to control ourselves. Just imagine, you know, we say, oh, I can't control my eyes. I like looking at beautiful, you know, Look at the lights, look at the creation of Allah, look at it. You know, there are only two restrictions on the eyes, okay? And I know time is short, I'm going to try to conclude in the next 10 minutes. There's only two conditions on the, uh, two restrictions in Islam on the eyes. Only two. Allah's blessed us. This is a ni'mah. Imagine for one moment, you know, just close your eyes and think. Sometimes you should think like that. Close your eyes and think. Imagine, Allah forbid, if I never had a sight. Imagine Allah took away, Allah forbid, la qadar Allah, if Allah took away the eyesight and then He said to us, I'll give your eyesight back one condition, don't look at anyone lustfully, wouldn't you be, would you say, oh it's too much fitna, no Allah, you know, it's too difficult. There's no excuse, think of it like that, there's no excuse. So, this is very important, there's only two restrictions on the eyes, Allah has blessed us this, with these beautiful eyes. You know, it's an amazing ni'mah. You can utilize these eyes in any way, shape or form. Look at the beautiful scenery. Look at the heavens. Look at the skies. Look at everything around you. Use your eyes to help in your life. But two conditions. One is, do not look at anyone lustfully. Simple, just two conditions. And the other one is, do not look at anyone with contempt. That's another rule. That you look down upon someone and you think yourself to be superior and others to be inferior. Anyway, moving quickly. So that, that was number three. Point number, sorry, number? One, two, three, four. What number was that? Four, yeah. Five, number five. Okay, again, we live, we are studying at the university. We have Muslims around us, we have non-Muslims around us. Islam places a lot of importance on maintaining general etiquettes and adab, being courteous and cordial in one's relationship with others. The Messenger of Allah again in a hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Al-Muslimu man salim al-Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadihi. The believer, the perfect believer is the one from whose hands and his mouth others are preserved, safeguarded and protected. Which means that we must live a life inside university, outside university, in a way that no one, and I mean when I say no one, no Muslim, non-Muslim human being and, or even an animal is harmed by what we do or what we say physically or verbally. That, that's the meaning of this hadith. We have to ensure when we're studying here, we don't, we don't hurt other people. We don't harm any people. The way we talk, it's full of etiquettes, it's adab. We have the perfect example for us in the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. لَمْ يَكُنِ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَاحِشًا وَلَا مُتَفَحِشًا وَلَا سَخَّابًا فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ وَلَا فَضًّا وَلَا غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was never fouled mouth. He, was, he would never curse anyone. He would never be harsh-hearted. He, he would never be uh, aggressive. He would be كَانَ أَلْيَنَ النَّاسِ he, Hadith of Bukhari, he was the most, he was the softest of individuals, the most tender of individuals. كَانَ بَسَّامًا ضَحَاكًا He was, he would always smile, he would always laugh. The hadith of Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, or the hadith of Jarir bin Abdullah al-Bajali where he says, مَا حَجَبَنِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مُنذُ أَسْلَمْتُ وَلَا رَآنِي إِلَّا تَبَسَّمَ فِي وَجْهِ Never did the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم see me, never did I greet him except that he had a smile in his face. It's a sunnah of the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم. So maintain good Islamic etiquettes. It's very important. Seriously, brothers, it's very important. And we, you know, the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم was sent by Allah as a rahmah, as a mercy, وما أرسل and this is in the Quran. And there's a hadith where the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's a beautiful hadith, one of my favorite hadith. The Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says in one hadith, 
He says, Bu'ithtu rahmatan muhdat. I have been sent to you as a mercy, as a gift. I've been sent as a mercy, given as a gift to you. Amazing hadith, which means that there is a gift. That Allah is the wahib, Allah is the giver of the gift. We are the recipients of the gift. The messenger of God sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the gift. This is, he is full of mercy. And we have a responsibility, brothers and sisters, to, to um, spread that rahmah and that mercy of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the rest of humanity. Our actions, unfortunately, you know, sometimes some of the non-Muslims, they are not to blame. They see our actions and they are pulled away from Islam because they see Islam through the Muslims. Many of the non-Muslims, they will not turn straight away to the Qur'an. Let me read the book, the Qur'an or the Hadith of Bukhari. What does Islam say? For them, Islam is what Muslims are. For them, Islam is what we do. So it's our responsibility, it's a duty, specifically in universities. It's a great duty that we act in a way that represents the true Islamic teachings, the, the character of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. You know, in the Quran, Allah says that be cord, cord, cordial and uh, courteous to Jarid al Qurba, Sahibi bil Jamb. That there are three types of people. Allah says, your next door neighbor, be extremely careful of his rights. Sahibi bil Jamb, your next door neighbor and the neighbor in your community and the third person is the one with whom you have occasional companionship you're, you're, you're standing in a line the one above you, uh, ahead of you the one behind you they are right don't do anything that will harm them you're studying at the university your fellow student don't do anything that will harm them show the good character of Islam. You know, there was a sheikh who was saying that once he, he met a, a person who, who had recently, this is quite unfortunate, recently accepted Islam a revert brother and he asked him, he said, what brought you to Islam? What was the reason? Why did you, what, had a, what impacted you? What was the main cause that contributed to your embracing and acceptance of Islam? Was it your, Islamic society? Was it the brothers at the Islamic society who, mashaAllah, you know, did a lot of good and, and, and presented the true nature of Islam to you? And were you impressed by the Muslims at your university? You know what his response was? And this is really serious because we need to think about this. You know what he said? He said, Alhamdulillah, all thanks to Allah that I met Islam before I met the Muslims. Had I met the Muslims before Islam, I wouldn't have been a Muslim today. Imagine how serious this is. We are becoming barriers for people coming into this beautiful religion of Allah. We have to, we have to show the true nature of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Be like the companions, be like the followers of the companions. One of the great Imams of this Ummah, and I'm concluding, his name was Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Shaybani. A great Imam of this Ummah, may Allah be pleased with him. He was living in a neighborhood where there were a lot of non-Muslims. He, he was living next to a Jewish person. His next door neighbor was a Jew. When that Jew uh, intended to leave the locality and the community, he put his house on sale. Somebody came to view the property and he wanted to purchase his property. The price was double. So he said, what's wrong? What's, what's up with you? You know, the price, it's double. He said, yes, double. One price for the property. The second price is because of living next to this great Muslim Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hasan. This is how Muslims should be. This is how Muslims are. That when, when, you, when you leave the university, even the non-Muslims, people around you, they think to themselves, you know, we're, we're going to miss you. You know, you are a source of great good in, in, in our community, in our society. So really try to, try to maintain the Islamic etiquettes. And there are no numerous etiquettes of how to converse with people. There are books written in terms of conversation, how to listen attentively, how to have a conversation, how to meet, how to greet, how to host, how to be a guest, how to visit the ill and sick, how to go and alleviate someone's distress and difficulty, how to offer your condolences. 
There are rules, study them inshallah. Point number six and seven, very short. Number six is try to have good company, stay in good company, remain in good company. Allah says, Ya yuladina amanu taqullah, wa kunu ma'asadiqin. Try to remain with the righteous people, especially if you yourself, you're not sound and grounded in your personal Islamic practice, then try to be around those people, inshallah, who will help you, who will make you a better human being, who will make you a better Muslim. And number seven, and the last point is very important as well and was alluded to by the, one of the brothers is, and you have a lot of courses here, seek sacred Islamic knowledge. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith of Sunan of Al-Imam ibn Majah, he says, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِضَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ Seeking of knowledge is an obligation upon every Muslim, which means that basic knowledge, basic knowledge is an obligation. You have you have the extensive knowledge, which is fard kifaya, which is the knowledge that is deep. And that's the responsibility of the scholars. But you have basic knowledge. Every Muslim, male or female, must obtain the basic knowledge of Islam. You must learn how to pray, how to purify yourselves. You know, you can have any degree in the world. You could be the greatest of doctors in the world. But if you have not learned how to pray, then it's of no consequence in the sight of Allah. Really, you know, I talked about intention. You can have the greatest of intention and you could do a world of good in the world. But for a Muslim, if you don't know how to pray, you don't know how to perform wudu, you don't know how to perform tayammum, ghusl, you don't know the rules of tahara, of purification, of zakat, of, of the other aspects of Islam, then it's of no consequence in the sight of Allah. Seek knowledge. You have a lot of classes here taking place like the brother Sheikh Ibrahim, one of my good friends, may Allah preserve him and give him a good rank and high rank and may Allah give you the ability to take benefit from him and the others who come here. Study the religious sciences. Not, don't study to argue and have debates. Study to be, become better Muslims, to worship Allah, to recognize Allah, to fulfill the rights of Allah and fulfill the rights of fellow human beings, insha'Allah ta'ala. And learn specifically, lastly, finally, finally, this is absolute final, and learn the laws related to your particular area of expertise. If you are a medic, learn the laws of Islam and medicine. Because Islam has laws in every area, every field. There are laws, right? And I mean, alhamdulillah, I know in London, there's actually a, 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 some of the university students have actually set up a an organization where they will focus primarily on medics, students, to uh, offer courses in terms of them learning about the various Islamic laws relating to all the medical issues, like because there are laws connected to birth control, abortion, cosmetic surgery, organ transplantation, blood transfusion, about uh, life support machines, about euthanasia, there are laws. So if you're in medicine, learn about all of these things, because you can't be a practicing Muslim doctor unless you know the laws of Islam relating to your field. If you're becoming a lawyer or a barrister or a solicitor, then learn the laws of Islam relating to your particular field and your particular area, inshaAllah ta'ala. So these are seven points and I apologize for going over time. But before I finish, I want somebody to mention all the seven points to me. Come on, fire away. Okay, all of you, point number one. Correcting of intention. Number two. Number two. Okay, don't waste time, value your time. I mentioned that three, but khair, no probs, no probs, no problem. That's number two. Number three. Sorry? Yeah, work hard, be experts, excel in your studies. Number three. Number four. Sorry? Some, I can't hear, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, control your passions, your desires, and you know, ensure you avoid sins, generally, all sins. Number five. Come on. Should have a better memory than that. Number five. Anyone? Sorry? Look, no, that was part of number four. Yeah, be Jazakallah Khair. Be courteous, mashallah. Maintain adab. Number six. 
Remain in good company, I'll help you out. Remain in good company. Surround yourselves with good people, inshallah. That doesn't mean, by the way, not to have any sort of interaction, connection with a, a sinful people or someone who's not practicing Islam. A'udhu billah, thumma a'udhu billah. That's not what Islam says. This is a, actually a very important point. That doesn't mean that for, I don't mean that for one moment. We have to try to help others to become good human beings and good Muslims. But if you're not grounded in your practice of Islam, it always helps to have good company so that you are support to, to, for one another. And number seven, the last point, learn about, inshallah, seek knowledge, seek sacred Islamic knowledge, learn about the rules of Islam, inshallah, specifically relating to your particular area of expertise, inshallah. I end with this, I pray Allah grant me the tawfiq, all of you, inshallah.